Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the past videos, we've looked at orbitals and wave functions for single atoms. Now that we've looked carefully at the Hamiltonians for such systems, we're ready to move on to more complicated systems, molecules and molecular ions. We'll see that if we remember what we learned in previous videos, it's not too hard to determine the Hamiltonians of larger systems. To start, let's think about the very simplest molecule we can have, the hydrogen plus ion. This system consists of three particles, two nuclei with an atomic number of one, and an electron. What will its Hamiltonian look like? Well, let's look at the Hamiltonian for the helium atom to get an idea of what the hydrogen plus Hamiltonian will be. We'll use atomic units to keep things looking simple. In the helium Hamiltonian, these terms are for the kinetic energy of the electrons. These are for the attraction between the electrons and the nucleus. And this one is for the repulsion between the electrons. For the hydrogen molecular ion, the situation is somewhat different. First, notice that the helium Hamiltonian doesn't have a term for the kinetic energy of the nucleus. That's because we defined the coordinate system so that the nucleus was always at the origin. But now that we have a system with two nuclei, we can't do that anymore. For that reason, we'll have to have kinetic energy terms for the nuclei. Notice what we have here. These look just like the term we had for the electron kinetic energy in the helium Hamiltonian except that we have the mass of each hydrogen nucleus in the denominator, where the subscript shows us which of the two hydrogens, A or B, the term is for. Actually, the term in the helium Hamiltonian also has the mass in the denominator. But you might remember that the mass of an electron is 1 in atomic units, so it dropped out. Anyway, next we need a term for the kinetic energy of the electron. That'll look just like the one in the helium Hamiltonian, except this time we don't need a subscript on it because there's only one electron in this system. Next, we need terms for the attraction between the electron and the nuclei. There are two nuclei, so there are two terms. In the denominator is the distance between the electron and the nucleus, either nucleus A or nucleus B. Finally, we need a term for the repulsion between the nuclei. Notice we're using a lowercase r for the distances that involve an electron, and a capital R for distances that only involve nuclei. That gives us a nice way to distinguish which particles the r refers to. Also, notice that all the terms begin with a minus sign except for the last one. That's because repulsions always increase the energy of a system, while attractions and kinetic energy always decrease it. Anyway, let's think about this Hamiltonian. It's the largest one we've had yet. Six terms, and this is the simplest molecule we could ever have, so other molecules will have even more complex Hamiltonians. Fortunately, there's a very common approximation we can make that'll make this Hamiltonian, and all the other ones, a little bit simpler. Here's how it works. Think about the particles that are in this system. There's an electron and two nuclei. The nuclei are made of protons, and in larger atoms the nuclei would contain several protons and neutrons. As you might know, a proton is about 1,836 times heavier than an electron. What does that mean for the Hamiltonian? Well, it means that the electron can move much faster than a nucleus. In fact, in comparison to an electron, a nucleus is essentially motionless. But wait, that means that the kinetic energy of a nucleus is nearly zero. That means we can drop those terms out of our Hamiltonian. That's true for every Hamiltonian for a system with more than one nucleus. We usually drop out the kinetic energy terms for the nuclei because the kinetic energy is so much smaller than it is for the electron. That's known as the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, named after the German physicist Max Born and the American physicist Robert Oppenheimer. Both of those scientists have really interesting stories. 
Max Born received the Nobel Prize for his work in quantum mechanics, and many of his students went on to make important contributions to physics, including Robert Oppenheimer, who we'll talk about in a moment. But when the Nazi party came to power in Germany, Born lost his university position because he was Jewish. Eventually, he had to flee the country with his wife, and he settled in England where he taught at Cambridge University. Meanwhile, Robert Oppenheimer's life was just as dramatic. He struggled with illness throughout his life, including tuberculosis and colitis, and he often became so engrossed in his scientific work that he would neglect to eat for so long that he'd sometimes become malnourished. On top of that, he was a chain smoker, and he suffered from long bouts of depression. But despite all that, he accomplished some of the greatest work in physics ever done in the United States. He worked with Max Born in the field of quantum mechanics, including the approximation that bears his name. And he was a crucial member of the Manhattan Project that developed the first atomic weapons. But once he realized how destructive atomic weapons are, he carried a deep sense of regret and guilt for the rest of his life. So after World War II, he was vocal in his opposition to the development of thermonuclear weapons. And that caused the House Un-American Activities Commission to investigate him, which eventually led him to be dismissed from his government-related positions. Anyway, now that we've applied the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, we have a somewhat simpler Hamiltonian, which we can now use in the Hartree-Fock method, or perturbation theory, to get the approximate energy and wave function of the system, as we saw in the previous video. That takes care of the H2 plus ion. But as you might guess, most systems are more complex than that. Let's try a slightly more complicated one, the hydrogen molecule, H2. The Hamiltonian for this system is very similar to the one for the H2 plus ion. There are two hydrogen nuclei, so there are two kinetic energy terms for the nuclei. There are also two electrons, so there are two kinetic energy terms for those. Next are terms for the attractions between the nuclei and the electrons. Since there are two of each, there are a total of four terms. Notice that the subscripts on R tell us which electron in a nucleus the term accounts for. Finally, there's a term for the repulsion between the two nuclei, and another for the repulsion between the two electrons. Again, the subscript on R tells us which particles the term accounts for. Just as in the previous example, we can apply the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which eliminates the terms for the kinetic energy of the nuclei. What we're left with is a Hamiltonian that has eight terms. You can see that the Hamiltonian will have lots of terms for systems that contain larger atoms or many different nuclei. For example, suppose we were looking at benzene. Benzene contains 12 atoms, 6 carbons, and 6 hydrogens. That means the Hamiltonian would have 12 terms for the kinetic energy of the nuclei. Those will drop out if we apply the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, but meanwhile there would be 42 terms for the kinetic energies of the electrons, because that's how many electrons a benzene molecule has. The number of attraction terms between the electrons and nuclei is truly massive. Each of the 42 electrons is attracted to each of the 12 nuclei, for a total of 504 terms. Meanwhile, each of the nuclei is repulsed by each of the other nuclei, for a total of 66 repulsion terms. And finally, each of the 42 electrons is repulsed by all the others. That gives us a total of 861 repulsion terms for the electrons. For a grand total, that gives us 1473 terms in the Hamiltonian for benzene. Luckily, there are all kinds of shortcuts we can take that allows a computer to solve the calculation using the Hartree-Fock method very quickly for a molecule like benzene but it would be a really difficult task for a human being to perform them with a pen and paper. One thing that's important to point out is that in the attraction and repulsion terms, the numerator contains the atomic number of the nucleus that's involved. 
So unlike the case for the hydrogen molecule and the H2 plus ion, the numerators of the potential energy terms won't all be 1. But molecules like the ones we've been looking at present another difficulty you might already have thought of. Let's look at the Hamiltonian for the H2 plus ion again. Suppose we want to use this Hamiltonian in the Hartree-Fock method. You might remember that the first step in that method is to construct a trial wave function. What should be the trial wave function for this system? You might recall that in a previous video, we just made a product of hydrogen wave functions, Slater-type orbitals, or sums of Gaussians. Each of those possible trial wave functions looks somewhat like an orbital of a hydrogen atom. For example, here's a trial wave function for a carbon atom similar to a 2px orbital. This type of orbital is known as an atomic orbital. But what about a system like our H2 plus ion? Well, when we combine atoms to form a molecule, the resulting wave function can be approximated by combining the atomic orbitals. This results in new and often very complicated shapes. The resulting overall wave function is called a molecular orbital, or MO. An important thing to keep in mind about MOs is that, unlike the wave functions we've looked at up to now, MOs are usually spread out over several atoms, not just one, because they're made up of atomic orbitals that were originally on individual atoms. So how do we get the equation for the trial wave function that the MO represents? The usual approximation we make is that an MO is just a linear combination of atomic orbitals. In other words, we get the MO by adding or subtracting atomic orbitals representing each of the atoms in the molecule. For example, H2 plus contains one electron. If the atoms were separate instead of bonded together, and the electron was in the ground state, the electron would be in the 1s orbital of either nucleus A or nucleus B. When we join the two atoms into the H2 plus ion, the 1s orbitals are combined to form a molecular orbital. As I mentioned earlier, we combine the orbitals by either adding or subtracting them. In other words, we form a linear combination of atomic orbitals, or LCAO. Notice that each one of these is multiplied by a constant called either Ca or Cb, because it's possible that the electron spends more time on either nucleus A or nucleus B. Let's see what these MOs look like. Here's a plot of psi star psi for the two separate 1s atomic orbitals. In this plot, we're imagining that the two atoms are separate that is, they're not actually bonded together. It's as though each atom was invisible to the other one. One of the nuclei is located here at x equals 0, and the other one is centered here. Now let's imagine that the two atoms can suddenly see each other, so the atomic orbitals will combine to form a molecular orbital. What will that look like? Here's what we get. Remember, we combine the two atomic orbitals by either taking the sum or the difference. The green curve represents the sum. Notice that since both atomic orbitals have a significant probability at the point halfway between the nuclei, when we add them to form the MO, the MO has a significant height at that position. On the other hand, when we take the difference between the atomic orbitals, the result is a probability of zero in that position. What does that mean physically? Well, remember, the wave function that describes an atomic orbital can be positive or negative. That gives us an interesting result. The MO representing the difference between the two atomic orbitals will have a node between the two nuclei a place where there's no probability of having an electron. On the other hand, the orbital resulting from the sum of the atomic orbitals will have a significant probability of having an electron at all the positions between the nuclei. 
That's what we mean when we say that there's a covalent bond between the atoms. The electron has a significant probability of being in all the positions in between the two atoms. So this MO is called a bonding molecular orbital. On the other hand, the MO that has the node between the nuclei is called an antibonding molecular orbital. Now in the hydrogen molecule, the two orbitals that overlap each other are two 1s orbitals, one on each atom. If you were to stand at one end of the molecule and look along the bond, it would look just like a circle. Bonds like this that look circular if you view them along the bond are called sigma bonds. It might seem as though only bonds made of s orbitals will look circular, but it turns out that other types of orbitals can also make circular looking bonds. For example, suppose we have a chlorine molecule, Cl2. The bond is made from two overlapping p orbitals. You might remember that there are three different p orbitals, each of them pointing along a different axis. These are definitely not round, but here's what happens in a chlorine molecule. The z axis is the one that connects the two atoms. In chlorine, the bond is made from the two p orbitals that point along this axis. When they overlap, we get something that looks like this. If we were to stand at one end of the molecule and look along the bond, here's what we'd see. This looks circular. That makes it a sigma bond. The bond looks like a circle from the end, even though the two orbitals themselves aren't round. Almost all single bonds are sigma bonds. All the single bonds in these molecules look circular when you view them along the bond. But what about double bonds? Well, a double bond consists of two bonds. One of them is still a sigma bond, usually made from two p orbitals along the z-axis. But the second bond is made from two p orbitals oriented along a different axis, either the x or the y. For example, here are two oxygen atoms, double bonded together. One of the two bonds is a sigma bond, made from the two p orbitals along the z-axis. But the other bond in the double bond comes from two p orbitals pointing in the x direction. Notice what happens. The two halves of each orbital are called lobes. And you can see that the lobes of one orbital overlap with the lobes of the other one. Here's what that looks like. If you were to look at this bond from along the z-axis, you'd see that the bond isn't circular. Instead, one lobe is above the center of the bond, and the other is below the center. Instead of a sigma bond, this is called a pi bond. So every single bond is a sigma bond, and every double bond is one sigma bond and one pi bond. What about a triple bond, like the one in a nitrogen molecule? In a triple bond, there are a total of three bonds, the first two are the same as in a double bond. One's a sigma bond made from two overlapping orbitals oriented along the z-axis, and the second is a pi bond made from two orbitals parallel to the x-axis. In the third bond, we have overlap between two p orbitals oriented in the direction of the y-axis, which is the one we haven't used yet. Just like the second bond, this one results from overlap between both lobes of the orbital. If you were to stand at the end of the molecule and look down the bond, you'd see that this one isn't circular. In fact, it looks just like the second bond, except the two halves of the orbitals are pointed to the left and right, instead of up and down. That means this bond is another pi bond. So, a triple bond consists of a sigma bond and two pi bonds. As you might have noticed, in order to have a pi bond, the atoms have to be pretty close to one another so that the p orbitals on each atom can overlap. That means a triple bond is usually very short, while double bonds are a bit longer and single bonds are the longest. That turns out to be very true. If we compare these three molecules, you can see that one has a nitrogen triple bond, one has a double bond, and one has a single bond. And just as we predicted, the triple bond is the shortest at 0.1093 nanometers. And the single bond is the longest at 0.1470 nanometers.
One last thing you might have noticed. The three p orbitals are all at right angles to each other, and the s orbitals are spherical. So how can we have a tetrahedral molecule like methane where the bond angle is 109.5 degrees? The key is to remember something I said earlier in this video. Electrons behave like waves, not particles. Imagine you're at the beach watching waves in the water. When two waves meet each other, they combine, and the larger wave you get as a result isn't shaped exactly like either of the two waves you started with. The same is true when we combine electrons. Remember, each orbital describes the shape of the wave for the electron we're looking at. When we combine electrons from different orbitals, we might get a very different shape than the orbitals we started with. There's a lot of math involved in figuring out exactly what the final shape will be. We won't do that math here, but for now, it's enough to know that if an atom only has single bonds, the valence s orbital and all three valence p orbitals of that atom combine. The shape of the orbitals that result is a tetrahedron. When valence orbitals combine in this way, the orbitals that result are called hybrid orbitals. And the one we just saw, where the hybrid orbitals have a tetrahedral shape, is called an sp3 hybrid. We also get an sp3 hybrid if the central atom has one or two unshared electron pairs on it, as long as all the bonds are single bonds. So, for example, the nitrogen and ammonia and the oxygen and water both have sp3 hybrid orbitals, and that's why their bond angles are about 109.5. If the central atom has one double bond, as in this formaldehyde molecule, then we get a different hybrid orbital, called an sp2 hybrid. This has a trigonal planar shape, so sp2 hybrid orbitals have a 120 degree angle between them. Just as with sp3 hybrids, sp2 hybrids can have an unshared electron pair on the central atom, as long as there's only one double bond on the atom. So, for example, the sulfur in sulfur dioxide has an sp2 hybrid orbital, which is why it has a bond angle of 120 degrees. Finally, if the central atom has a triple bond, or two double bonds, then the orbitals combine to make hybrid orbitals that form a linear molecule. This type of hybrid is called an sp hybrid. The carbon and carbon dioxide, and also an acetylene, both have sp hybrid orbitals, and that's why these are linear molecules. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next two videos, we'll look more closely at molecular orbitals, and we'll find out what we can learn from them. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.